All right, welcome. We are here because the European Union has a new strategy to deal with the vast amounts of chemicals that we are exposed to every day. It's called the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, and it aims to be the most health protective chemical strategy in the world. But as we point out today, it needs the right leaders to make this happen. So I am really happy to be joined by Dr. Pete Myers. He is my friend. He is the founder and chief scientist of Environmental Health Sciences. Pete, how are you? I'm fine. It's such a delight to be on with you, Brian. Yes, it is a delight. It's always a delight to see your face and some of your wonderful bird photography behind you. So Pete, as you know, in a new four-part series on ehn.org today, Dr. Terry Collins, a friend of yours and a chemist and professor at Carnegie Mellon, examines what qualities of leadership are essential for ensuring that the strategy in the EU inspires trust in Europeans and beyond that the chemicals in use are safe. So first, can you just kind of give us an overview of what the strategy is in the EU and why it's different than what we've seen in the past? Sure, but let me start with a few comments about Dr. Terence Collins, who is a friend um, of longstanding. I think of Terry as the Richard Feynman of chemistry. Feynman, a, physics, a physicist, was known for being in incredibly intuitive in how he approached problems, reaching solutions that most physicists couldn't fathom. But time and again, he was proven right. Well, Terry is an incredibly intuitive chemist, but also he's a highly trained, a very sophisticated chemist. Uh, and um, what's especially fun about him is that he was classically trained um, as a scholar in New Zealand. And this guy's range of knowledge of issues is so broad. It's, it's kind of reminded me of what was said by JFK of Thomas Jefferson, which uh, when he invited a group of people to the White House to meet with him for dinner, he said that the only time, more or less, the only time that the people gathered here are smarter than the group, the folks we have today is when it's Thomas Jefferson alone. Harry is also a Thomas Jefferson, thinking about politics, thinking about psychology, and that's what has led him to write this series of essays. Now, that's just some introductory comments about this man I respect hugely. Um, the chemical strat chemicals strategy for sustainability, let me start that again. The chemical strategy for sustainability is a brilliant new approach to trying to take the chem chemical enterprise, which has caused so many problems, but brought so many miracles into the world over the last 200 years. Um, it's, it's an effort to try and lead towards true sustainability of that enterprise. And I'm most excited because as the chemical enterprise was being formulated over the, literally the last more than a dozen years, and I've been involved in efforts to try and help it move in the right direction. What it's done in these last dozen plus years is acknowledge that they'll get it wrong if they don't use principles and the science of endocrinology to guide their decision-making. Endocrine disruption is something I've worked on for a long time. It's not the only chemical toxicity issue is, that's important, but it is extraordinarily complicated to attack because it involves such low doses. And sometimes the regulatory system that we've depended upon for at least 100 years fails miserably in detecting dangerous chemicals, hazardous materials. And what the European Council and Commission, with the encouragement of the European Parliament, did over this last decade plus was to fully embrace endocrine disruption science as a, as a necessary element of how they think about what's safe and what's not. That's extraordinary. It's been a long battle. Uh, that's baked into the definition of the chemical strategy. Unfortunately, we all know from having worked in this arena for a long time that the strategy is one thing, the imp implementation is another thing. 
clearly the impl implementation should build upon the strategy, but uh, things get thrown into the works and gum it up. And that's why Terry's essay is so important because essays, because he has tried to identify um, personality types, specifically with respect to the challenge of endocrine disruption, personality types that are going to play roles in implementation. And it's absolutely crucial that the European Union engage with people who are going to help rather than hinder the implementation. So where the rubber meets the road are the people that put this into place, that actualize the strategy. And Terry writes about it. Um, he uses a slightly different word than personality. He says disposition. So sustainability dispositions, the traits of people who should and shouldn't be leading this new strategy. So I assume, and thank you for the context of who Terry is. He is a, a, a hero, a, a giant in this field. So I assume you agree with him. But what traits do you think the EU should be looking for putting the strategy into place? Well, I, I think they have to think simultaneously about the traits they want and the traits that they don't walk, want. And Terry addresses both of those. Probably the two, of the seven sustainability dispositions, the two most important are what he calls the exploiters and the engagers. The exploiters are going to be the real problem. They see opportunity for personal gain in assisting industry attempts to ignore endocrine disruption. They manufacture doubt. They play all sorts of games with the data. They're a big problem. And unfortunately, because endocrine disruption is a threat to an existential threat to the chemical enterprise as, as it is currently organized, there's going to be a lot of money behind them. So we have to make sure exploiters with obvious conflicts of interest and sometimes not very obvious conflicts of interest are identified and kept out of the decision-making process. The engagers are the source of hope. Engagers take positive action when scientific facts demand that injustice and hazardous information can't be ignored. They are faithful to scientific data and justice. They're indefatigable uh, because that's what it takes. Uh, the exploiters don't give up very easily. The engagers cannot ignore the social and environmental justice issues that pervade this suite of, of concerns. And as I said, they, they provide true hope for the future. Those are the engagers. So in any strategy, it's it's a piecemeal, it's a process that that is piecemeal by nature and it can take a long time. So I'm wondering, what are you looking for as the strategy starts to take shape to determine whether or not it's truly being pr progressive and health protective? Well, the first thing I'm looking at is who has the European Union engaged and where do they fall in this list of Terry's seven sustainability disciplines? If they get the wrong people, it will go and give them decision-making authority in the implementation process, it will not go well. So you got to look at the people. You have to help them understand who's going to be a constructive player and who's going to be an exploiter or one of the other dark forces that will have an influence. Also, you need to work to make sure they know who the engagers are. Who are the people who are taking positive action? So, there are a couple of, so that's that's about the people that are involved here. What about the substance? There are a few endocrinological principles that are bedrock to getting the chemical strategy for sustainability right. One of them is that there's a true, deep, and steadfast commitment to identifying low-dose responses to endocrine-disrupting compounds. These compounds typically cannot be detected using traditional toxicological rules. So if this is the implementation of the chemical strategy for sustainability is going to go off in the right direction, they've got to focus on low dose effects of endocrine disrupting compounds. And to do that, they have to acknowledge that 
as is true with hormones, which are a core part of the endocrine system, and hormones are what endocrine disrupting compounds mess with, they hack them, um, they've got to build a testing system that is capable of detecting low, low, those low dose effects. And it requires understanding that high dose testing cannot be depended upon to identify low dose results, low dose impacts, low dose adverse effects. The science behind this, while it sounds complicated, it's actually kind of simple. As hormone levels go up, at different doses of those hormone levels, different genes are engaged, so different things happen. And sometimes it's it's actually kind of wonderful to watch. At high doses, genes that have been turned on by low doses are turned off by high doses. Well, endocrine disruptors behave in the same way. You ha can have uh, the, the complete opposite effect at low doses that you have at high doses. And the most visually uh, compelling example of that has to do with a subset of endocrine disrupting compounds called obesogens. And there, it's very simple. There are chemicals which at low doses cause morbid obesity, and at high doses, they cause weight loss. So if you have structured your testing regimen to begin at high doses and only look for impacts that are seen at high doses, you never see the low dose consequences of exposure that includes morbid obesity. So that, that for me, that is the single most important central element of the chemical strategy for sustainability. Not the only one, but that's the most important. And could a strategy like this work in the US? EHN has been pretty, uh, uh, we have covered this for a long time, the failures of the FDA, the EPA in accounting for these kind of low dose exposures. So could it happen here? And if so, what needs to happen? Well, yes, it could happen here. That's a different question than will it happen here? Uh, as you said, we've been working on this for a long time and we're seeing some movement. But I think that ultimately one of the deciding factors influencing the outcome is going to take place in the market because the chemical strategy for sustainability in Europe is going to lead to safer materials being used in the marketplace. Consumers, people, members of parliament want safer materials. And that market pull, if it's strong enough, will force the US industry to go along. And right now, probably the best example of this is a recent decision by the European Food Safety Authority, which last year recommended that the tolerable daily intake of bisphenol A, that most infamous of all endocrine disrupting compounds, the tolerable daily intake is what you can be exposed to on a daily basis and not get hurt. The, the European Food Safety Authority last year, the year before last, around Christmas time, recommended that the tolerable daily intake of BPA be reduced by a factor of 100,000. That's going to take it down to a million times below what the FDA currently considers safe. There's this huge, dramatic difference between what the European food safety folks are thinking is safe and the US FDA. Somehow that conflict is going to be resolved. And I think the market is going to take it in the direction of where the European Food Safety Authority has gone. 